Good morning, everybody. I'm Sheena, Sheena Wright. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I've been in Dar es Salaam for two years. I started attending the Ocean Church a week after I arrived to Dar, so I've been an Oceanite as long as I've been in Dar es Salaam. Um, yeah. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about passion for purity and get you started with this discussion um, about purity. I'm a counselor at the International School of Tanganyika. I work with teenagers, um, kids, and helping to guide them. It's one of my passions, and I'm going to talk to you about that as well throughout my presentation. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Edgar. Okay, so today, what is the challenge? The challenge of this seminar, um, we are here to challenge you to uh, be passionate about purity. Be passionate about purity um, by honoring God with your bodies, with your minds, um, through championing purity in your life. So first things first, we're gonna define what is passion and what is purity. So passion, I have the definition on the screen, you guys see it? All right, I'll read it out loud. Passion is an extreme or intense emotion or enthusiasm, an abundant, almost uncontrollable excitement or desire. So start thinking about what are you passionate about? Just start thinking about that in your mind. Purity. So on the purity bracelets, Carol had explained um, these purity bracelets to you. We have the, the verse, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, and it reads, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So in this context, when we're talking about purity, we're talking about purifying ourselves by removing anything from our life that is not of God. Removing anything from our life that contaminates our body, that contaminates our spirit, contaminates our mind. So anything that is not in line with the truth, anything that is not in line with God's word. Are we clear on passion and on purity? Okay. So I like examples because I'm an educator. So I'm going to give you some examples. Um, we're just going to share in a pair. You're sitting next to somebody. I want you to ask um, your partner this question. If someone interviewed your family, your friends, your colleagues, and they said, what is, what is this person passionate about? What would they say? And why would they say that? So just talk to the person sitting next to you to answer that question. I'll give you guys about three minutes to have those conversations. <laughs> I'm hearing the conversation start to quiet down, so hopefully you've all been able to share what your family, your friends, your colleagues say you're passionate about and why they would say that. So this is just an opportunity so that you have examples of what passion is um, in this group, in this audience of people. Um, another example of passion, I'm going to call my friend Isaac because Isaac has some passions that he shares um, with us in, in the ocean community. So I just want to give him an opportunity to come up for about 10 minutes to share this passion with all of us. Thank you, Isaac. Hi. 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 How are you guys doing? Doing good. Yeah, so uh, as Sheena said, I believe Yeah, I believe um, at least some of you know that I'm passionate about music. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I have been passionate about music for like, um, I don't know, for as long as I can remember. Like, um, I remember, I even remember I used to like write, there's a memory that I have in my mind of some lyrics that I wrote when I was like about five, six years old. Yeah, so to me, having such a cause, it's a memory that has stuck to me to this day. Like I still remember even what I wrote. So to me, it sounds like a, 
like a like um like a sign from God that God has placed this passion for music in me because I have never forgotten that memory. And um I have had that passion even it, it like music has interfered in like everything that I've ever done. When I was in school, I used to write a lot when I'm in class, like when guys are studying or guys are making noise, I would write a lot of music. That was high school. I remember um, when I went to college, I was still writing a lot. I even got um, I got signed to a music label when I was in when I was in college. So I have had like that passion inside of me for a very long time. And um, so there's something that I believe we are all seeing: how the media is growing. Um, the media has become so powerful in the in in the in this last, um, in the few past years, uh, <clears throat> there's been um, the I mean the in, the internet is giving power to the media. Um, nowadays, it's people um, people own cell phones and um, iPads and tablets and things like that, and they give power to the internet. I mean, they give power to the media. So. Uh, also, um, I've been looking at some statistics and I saw that um, the statistics of new internet users is doubling every year. For example, if last year was maybe 3, I mean if it was 1.5 last year, then you'll find out that this year it is, it is already 3 billion. For example, for, for, for now I remember the, the figures were like almost 3 billion people are using the internet, like lately, 3 point something billion. That is almost like, it's about to be like the 7 billion guys in the world. So uh, it's going like that. And looking at statistics of things like um, YouTube and um, Facebook and stuff. For example, YouTube has 1.7 billion users. I mean, that is Facebook. YouTube has like 1 billion users. And um, the, amount of, uh, uh, the, the amount of hours that are watched every month are like um, a billion hours every month, like views. And most of those views come from cell phones. So the media is getting more and more powerful. So uh, something else that I came to notice is that um, the media, um, it puts some people as icons in our generations. They become like role models to the society. For example, um, I can take an example of someone like maybe Beyonce or Drake. These people, we, we may just see them as musicians, but they're actually affecting the lives of the people that, the people around us. For example, we might be graced to know, to know Christ and we might see what they do and know that that is not, um, that is immoral, it's not pure, it doesn't have any, it doesn't go in line with my principles of life. So we might be able to like um, live a life and neglect what we see from them. But as human beings, we, we have a tendency of um, learning from what we see. We might not; we, it might be consciously or, or unconsciously. For example, there's something that that I read that kids kids can you don't teach a kid how to use a spoon, but just by imitating, they'll know how to use a spoon. And I have noticed that uh, even us as human beings, we learn by imitating, like by by um, what we see the, most of the time. So these people in the media are actually affecting the lives of mostly the young adults. For example, I don't know if we might have examples in a room this size, I believe there are some people, at some age, you had some type of traits of a, I don't know, a, a public figure. Some public figure. So maybe, I don't know, there are some, for example, maybe um, like a star in a movie or um, in some series, you find that people start acting like that person without them knowing. So they have like, they speak like those people, they act like those people, and these people are being raised to be like role models in our societies. And these things, normally, and it, they used to like, I, I didn't feel right when I saw people acting like someone, maybe like, um, maybe two chains or some, or people like that. These guys have very wrong mindsets, like ideas of what life is. But these are the people that the kids in the society, in our societies, are looking up to. So it's like, they look up to them and see like, that is life. 
So their language becomes like their language, their ideas of how to like explore their sexuality becomes like theirs, because these guys like objectify women and stuff like that. And these guys are actually um, negatively impacting the lives of our kids. So I developed a passion of trying to um, child to, to like fight that thing that is being raised. And I was talking about how powerful the media is and it's one of the tools that we can use to um, make this right. Because we cannot sit back and like um, blame the media for what is happening. Well, the media is just a tool that, that is actually helpful for us. It's a tool that we can use to do positive or bad. For example, I gave an example of fire the last time. That fire can be used to warm a house, but the same fire can be used to burn it down. So it's the same thing as the media. The media is something that we can use to reach the ends of the, uh, to, to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the earth. And also to like, um, uh, raise role models or icons in, in the society that have the right morals, that uphold the right morals, like champion impurity and things like that. And we can also have content in the media that is supporting content like this. So that has been my challenge. So I started um, building up a studio and the studio is to like support artists who are, um, who have such like, um, such traits. Yeah, so that is the passion that I have for music. So we are working with Fearless Faith and more of my friends to develop content that develop content that is upholding such principles. Now uh, there's a there's a media campaign that we're doing with um, Fearless where we had like themes that we're supposed to like develop uh, pieces for those the themes. So as a coincidence, one of the theme was purity. So as just to finish, and just another example. I'll do a very short uh, verse. I just wrote a short verse because we are supposed to do like one minute, one minute, 30, 30 second pieces. So this is one quick piece that we did that is champion impurity. <laughs> Sacramental wine from a holy grail, your quest for purity, full of insecurities. That is simply a sign of immaturity. Judging a brother so fly in some Louis V. You heart drop it, so give up, but I'm doing it. No one's holy or best yet is pursuing it. These are my two cents, no point in suing me. But the acts of their flesh are obvious, whether small or PRG is so notorious. While yes, stupid fool is never cautious. Shall we sleep? Because we are under his glorious grace, only deceive ourselves and no one else. Yes, to me his grace is holiness, a state of rest in his robe of righteousness. I quit paying the price that Christ already paid. Yeah. Paid the price of Christ already paid. It's already paid, man. Yeah, I say quit paying the price of Christ already paid. It's already paid, man. Right. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Quit paying the price of Christ already paid. It's already paid, man. about um, that you realize that what you are passionate about people see that people see that in your life um, so it's important that we understand that about ourselves that our passions grow beyond our small space other people do see what we're passionate about um, and this seminar is to challenge you to be passionate about your purity and passionate about your walk with God um, in John 13 14 to 15 it says if I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did. I'm passionate about mentoring young people, about working with young people. I've dedicated my entire life to this passion. Um, when I graduated from university, I actually went to university for media. Uh, and then while I was freelancing, I was a freelance uh, editor at a television company. 
And while I was doing that, I was mentoring young girls, young girls that were having difficulties in their life. I was, I was available. So I was there working with them and mentoring them. Um, and during this time, I had started reading the Word. I hadn't yet started going to church, but I, I did start reading the Bible um, at that time in my life. And what I began to notice is that Jesus is our example. The only way that I can lead children is by following Jesus. So this is something really important to me um, because it's a passion that I have and I need to be intentional about my purity if, if I'm trying to mentor young people. In Proverbs 22, 6, I think we all know this one, start children off on the way that they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Um, I read a news article in the Guardian, the Guardian newspaper, and it was talking about abortions in Tanzania. Abortion is illegal in this country, and the news article was talking about abortion, and how many of the young girls who are going to see the gynecologist are going to see the gynecologist because of complications due to the illegal abortions that are happening in the country. And as I'm reading through this article, another statistic had um, popped up and it said that 32% of Tanzanians, average age 15, are having sex. And half of them are having sex with more than one person. So 15 uh, years old, um, 32%, that's, that's huge. But as I continue to research and prepare um, my presentation today, I found another statistic, and it said that 10% of Christians actually live lives that look different from the rest of the world. And that's, that really hit hard, 10% of Christians. I said, what does that even mean? What it means is that 90% of Christians are good people, like everybody else, working hard, doing the best that they can to put food on the table, to take care of one another, um, but being good people, doesn't mean that you're following Christ. You may know of Christ, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're following him and that your life looks like you're following Christ, right? So I said, after I saw that, I said, well, praise God that only 32% of Tanzanians, uh, teenagers are having sex if 90% of the adults in their lives are not living according to God's word, yeah. right? Yeah. Praise God for protection yeah. over these children. Um, in Tanzania and we need to pray for the ones that that are lost because a lot of them are lost because of us we need to pray for ourselves and we need to pray for them and we're here to work on ourselves first yeah. right to minister to minister to ourselves first and that's why only oceanites are in the building today um, because we have to start at home yeah. with this yeah. issue yeah. Yeah. Good, yeah. this was shared with me on Sunday and I've been praying over this scripture, Mark 9, 42. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. I was like, Jesus, you're talking to me. You would throw me into the sea. We're friends. Like, you love me, right? And he does. But if I'm his friend, I have to follow his commands. And Jesus is telling us in this scripture, me in particular, because this is speaking to my heart. He's saying, it is better for you to completely remove yourself from these children's lives. It is better for you to not be a counselor. It is better for you to not step foot in the school. It's better for you to jump in the sea with something weighing you down than to stumble yourself and then bring others with you. Yeah. Just jump in the sea. This is Jesus talking. Yeah. He's like, just, you know, drown yourself because... <laughs> There is, you know, that's, that hits hard for me. And it puts my position in children's lives in perspective. The role that I play when I'm mentoring children is so important. It's so important and I have to, to be living according to God's word. I have to be walking um, and being led by the Holy Spirit so that I don't cause any of these kids to stumble because they will see my life. And even if I think they don't know, kids always know. They always know. They always know what's going on. They know what's going on in the house. We try to pretend like kids don't get it, like they're too young to understand. Kids understand things from a very young age. They know what's happening. And they imitate us, like Isaac was saying. This is how they learn. And that's why um, 
in Proverbs 22, 6, it says, start them off on the way that they should go, and they won't depart from it. They're learning early to imitate behaviors, and they should be imitating behaviors that are pleasing to God. And we are examples, and examples are really important. Speaking of examples, I'm going to tell you a story. Some of you may know this story, so don't give it away. Okay? Um, it's the story of a concerned father. So a dad, it's the middle of the night, he can't sleep, and he looks out the window, and he sees one of his friends, his son's friends, um, in the alley. It's the middle of the night, and he's like, what is this, what is this guy doing out in the alley? I know that kid. Um, and then he sees the neighbor, an older woman. He knows that this lady is married. And now he's freaking out. He's like, what? What? happening. It's the middle of the night. This kid's out here, right? It's scandalous. It's scandalous. So he's freaking out. And he hears them talking because they're just right in front of his window. He hears them talking. She's like, oh, my husband's not home. You know, I've, I've prepared the house for us. Nobody's going to see us. It's late. This dad doesn't sleep at all. He can't wait until the sun comes up so that he can talk to his son because he's furious, right? His son hasn't done anything. But he's mad at his son, even though he hasn't done anything. So he wakes his son up and he says, listen to me, listen to every single thing that I'm about to tell you. Are you paying attention? The boy's still in the bed. He's like, yeah, yeah I am. No way. <laughs> what are you upset about that? He's like, listen to every word. Let me be your teacher, son. I'm going to teach you some things. Take notes. Write it down. I, write it on the tablet of your heart. Keep it inside of you forever. He still hasn't even told his son what's happening, but he's going on, right? Have you taken the notes? Are you paying attention? Look at me, wipe the sleep out of your eyes, and pay attention to me. Okay, all right, Dad, calm down. And then he goes on to tell him this story. He says, I saw this naive, trifling friend of yours in the middle of the night when I was getting up. In the middle of the night, it was dark, okay? It was dark, like pitch black outside, dark nighttime, and he's outside. Guess what? He was outside with a married woman, the lady across the street. That better not be you. That better not be you. Don't be that guy. Why would a father have that conversation with his son? Can anybody picture this in their mind? Why would a father have that conversation with his son? Anybody? I'm asking the audience. <laughs> Why? Yes, Isabel. He loves him very much. He doesn't want him to be in that position. Angel? He's scared and concerned. He's scared and concerned for his child. Anybody else? Edgar? Uh, maybe because he's not sure if he's brought his son up well enough for the son to make his own decision. So he's like, Okay. Being cautious. Okay. Do you guys know where that story is from? I spiced it up a little bit. Where is the story from? Proverbs 7. I love this story. I think it's hilarious. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this person is going off. Please read it. Please read it in, for what it is because there are so many exaggerations in Proverbs 7 that I laugh every time I read it. It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story. Uh, in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God speaks into our lives through the Holy Spirit. He also sends people to speak into our lives, and sometimes those people, we don't even understand why they're exaggerating. Why are you being so serious, right? Maybe we haven't even done anything yet. But people are trying to pour into our lives and they're trying to speak into our lives. We need to be open to being taught by people. We need to be open to learning from other people's mistakes. Because God has a plan for us. And it's not to harm us, it's not to nag us, it's to give us hope and to give us a future. One of my favorite songs, 119.66. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I trust your commands. Teach me. Teach me. You have to be teachable to be taught. So I'm going to ask.
going to ask you a question. Do you trust God's commands? Do you trust the things that he's telling you? Are you open to the lessons that he has for you? Because that will determine how teachable you are. I shared in the last P3 the scripture, Colossians 3.5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Put to death. So here in Colossians, it's telling us, put it to death, burn it, bury it, whatever you got to do, eliminate it from your life. These things are a part of your earthly nature, and there is no room for these things in your walk with Christ. Right? But many of us Christians, perhaps 90% if the statistics are correct, make a lot of excuses for why we don't put these things to death in our lives. Some excuses may be, well, we're going to get married anyway, so maybe it's not that big of a deal right now. Right? We'll repent, get married anyway, it's all good. So I'm going to do a little activity. It's to get you moving and to get you thinking. Um, I want you to pin up your excuses, literally. You're going to pin them up. Chris is going to help me out, passing out a piece of paper. Write down an excuse, an excuse for why we don't put our earthly nature to death, why we don't eliminate it from our lives and never look back. You can write it in Swahili, sometimes things don't translate directly, right? So what are some of our excuses for not putting impurities in our life to death? If you need something to write with, there's pencils going around as well. So write down any excuse. OG, can we go back to Colossians, please? So that we can see the, the verse. What are some excuses that Christians use? Okay, this is specific to our community. Some excuses that Christians use, or that you have used, um, for not putting to death sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, greed. What are some of those excuses? Write them down, and when you've written them down, stand up. Come up here, and you're going to pin it to my pin board. I have some pins. We're just going to pin them up. So we're going to talk about why we do this, about why we make excuses. Um, I'm going to read off some of them. I'll stop after this one time. I'll stop after this time. Sexual desire is natural. God will forgive me. I can't stop. I'll be lonely. But I don't have anyone else than this. It's hard to follow it in humanity, so I guess it's hard to follow scripture, like in walking it out. Everyone's doing it. <laughs> I'm too young to not have sex. It's hard. No one's perfect. We're already married in our hearts. <laughs> for our behavior, and we're going to have this board up here, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. So why do we do this? Paul is a really good, my sound guys tell me I need the money. Paul is a really good example of confusion. 
when you experience confusion. In Romans 7.15 to 7, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. So Paul is saying, I believe this, but I'm doing this. I don't understand it. All I know is that it's the sin living inside of me that's causing me to do these things. When I was in graduate school, I had to study many different psychological theories to get um, certified as a counselor. One of the theories that I came across is called cognitive dissonance theory. I'm not going to give you the master's level definition, but I will break it down in a way that we can all understand it. Cognitive is referring to the mind. Dissonance to discomfort. So cognitive dissonance theory looks at the mind when it's uncomfortable because your beliefs are not in line with your actions or your attitude. Okay, it's that discomfort that we experience inside of us when what we believe in and what we're doing is not in line with each other. So what happens when we're experiencing mental discomfort, when we're experiencing Okay, I believe this, but I want to do this, or I believe this, but I've done that. What happens to us? Actually, when we're in this state of mind, according to this theory, we are motivated to find inner peace. We're motivated to find harmony um, with ourselves. And that motivation will cause us to do something. It will cause us to change something because people don't like being uncomfortable. People like feeling good. Right? So it will cause us to change something. So we do one of three things. We one, we change our behavior, makes sense. We believe in something, but we're doing something, we stop doing that thing. Right? If we're doing something that we don't believe in. And there's two other things that we do. Instead of changing our behavior, we change our perception of the behavior by justifying it. So we justify by making excuses, and we have a lot of lovely ones here pinned to the board, or we justify our behavior by devaluing our belief, devaluing what we believed in from the beginning, right? So that we can have harmony. And people seek harmony in any of these three areas, either by changing their behavior or changing their perception of what they're doing, either through justifying what they're doing or through saying, Actually, I don't really believe that. So an example of this would be regarding one of these excuses, we're married in our hearts. I'll use that one because that was the last one I said and that's what I remember. If you're having sex with your partner, and when we're talking about sex in this seminar, just to clarify, we're talking about all types of sexual activity. We're talking about sexual intercourse, we're talking about oral sex, we're talking about anal sex, we're talking about masturbation with your partner. Okay, so all types of sexual activity we're referring to. Right. So we're, we're going to get married anyway, or we're already married in our hearts. Scripture tells us that we should not have sex outside of marriage. Sex isn't a bad thing, but there's a time and a place for it, and it's within the sanctity of marriage. Okay, We're not here to demonize sex. Yeah. We're here to tell you that there's a time and a place for it, and God has created that space within marriage. Okay? So we already know the truth about sex, that it's something that should be experienced with your husband, with your wife. So these excuses come in, we're justifying it, we're justifying it. Well, we're married in our hearts. And then you have harmony and you have peace and you continue doing what you're doing. Because you're no longer in that state of dissonance, in that state of confusion about how do I believe this but I'm doing that. You can, believe, you can be doing that because now you've said we're married in our hearts. Now you've said, everybody else is doing it. So that's why you can continue on with that behavior. <clears throat> or you devalue your belief. Scripture is thousands of years old. It doesn't apply to today. Things have changed. There's a lot of different influences in our life that weren't in the lives of the, the, the Jews. It's not even the same culture. Right? You're starting to devalue what you believe in to feel better about your, your state of mind, to have harmony in your state of mind. In Romans 1.25, it talks about people who have all of these excuses. It says that they exchange the truth of God for a lie. 
and worshipped and served the created rather than the creator. So in this seminar of challenging you to be passionate about purity, I have to tell you that these are not excuses, they're lies. Every single thing that you pin to this board should be pinned to the cross, and you should leave it there. Because these are lies, and they will hold us in bondage, and they will continue to give us a false sense of harmony. Romans goes on to say, and I didn't write the whole um, thing out because it was quite long, but Romans 1, 18 to 32, can you guys see on the board? It's very small, so I'll read some of them out. These were the things that they had um, exchanged the truth for. They exchanged the truth for homosexuality, for deceit, for greed, for slander, for arrogance, for boastfulness. Um, it also says that they're inventors of evil. I love this one. It's like the enemy did not cause you to do that. That was you. You made that up, right? Disobedient to parents without understanding. It caused them untrustworthy and unloving. And these were people who knew scripture. But they exchanged the truth of God for this list of words that they're called at this time. What are some of the consequences then of impurity? What are some of the consequences in our lives for making excuses for our behavior, making excuses for our attitude, and pretending that we're fine, but we've really just embraced this false sense of harmony? What are some of the consequences of that? It breaks our fellowship with God. Please write the scripture down so that you can read it later. Romans 1, 18 to 32. In these verses, it tells us that God gave them over to the things that they had in their heart. He gave them over to their lust. He gave them over to their greed. He gave them over to their desires. What does that mean? What does that mean? God did not intervene. They had exchanged the truth for a lie for so long that they were desensitized to the, to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. They continue to make these excuses for themselves. They continue to engage in behavior that they knew wasn't right. And not only did they continue to engage in it, but scripture says that they um, approved of anyone else who behaved that way. There were no lightning bolts. There was no plague. Sin just ran its course in their life. It just ran its course, and God let it run its course in their life. There was no big intervention from God. A consequence of our impurity is that it breaks our fellowship with the Lord. He's there, but you're not listening to him. You're not connected to him. You don't even care. You have no respect for him as the creator of all things. It breaks our sense of inner harmony. That peace that we seek our peace is found in lies and not in the truth. So it breaks our own hearts and our inner sense of harmony, which ultimately breaks us down even further. And it causes broken relationships and potential relationships with other people. If we're to love God and to love others as ourselves, how can we do that when we haven't even figured out how to love God? We haven't even figured out how to respect and love and fear our Creator. He has told us the way that we should walk, and we don't walk that way. We know of him, we say we believe in him, but we're not actually following him. In Proverbs 3, 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. These excuses is our own understanding. God tells us what we should do. When we have moments of, co of cognitive dissonance, when we're confused, when we feel uncomfortable, we should line our attitudes and our behaviors back up with scripture. We don't need to figure it out on our own. We don't need to sit down and have so many excuses that it covers the board. We don't need to do that. We don't need to lean on our own understanding. We shouldn't even lean on our own understanding. We should be leaning on the word of God and following the example of Jesus Christ. Jesus. 
As we move on to Romans 1 to 13, when Paul was talking about, I don't understand it. I don't understand why, why I believe one thing and then I do another. He doesn't just end there and say, I don't understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. He also goes on to tell us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He tells us that in scripture. Jesus has set us free through his sacrifice on the cross, through the blood that he shed on the cross. We don't have to live in bondage. Yeah. We don't have to. If we're walking out of line, we have the power of the Holy Spirit to line us back up with the word and to line us back up with Jesus. It says that if the spirit of God dwells in you, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. So it's hard. That was one of the excuses. It's hard. Yeah, it is hard. And if you try to do it by yourself, it'll be impossible. Yeah. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us, and we need to be able to embrace the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can walk in purity, so that we can follow the example of Jesus. Romans 8.14, for all those who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So I'm going to ask you just to reflect on yourself. Are you being led by the Spirit of God? Are you? Because if you're not, you're not included in this sentence. Those that are being led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So are you just someone who knows of Jesus and goes to church? Or do you follow his commands? Have you embraced this teaching that Jesus came for? Have you accepted that he died on the cross for you and now you are empowered to walk differently from the rest of the world? Or are 90% of us in this room living lives like everyone else and not following Jesus, just being good people, making excuses for things that are not in line with the scriptures? That's something that you have to reflect on yourself. If you're not following God's commands, how can he teach you? How can he pour into your life? How can you hear the Holy Spirit? The good news is that there's restoration. So where do we begin? I'm not just going to leave you with that, right? Because there's some of us in here that are not following Christ. You, believe, you know scripture, you've read it, but you're not actually following Christ. And we have to be real with ourselves if that's the case. From right now, forwards. From right now, today, in this moment, if you felt mm -hmm. convicted, from right now, you have to change. If you delay changing, that's also disobedience. Your changing has to start today. It has to start in this moment. My sister says, uh, ain't no shame in the game of restoration. God already <laughs> knows. He already knows if you're sleeping with somebody. He already knows if you're sleeping with more than one person. He already knows if you're sleeping with somebody who's married. He knows that already. Yeah. You have to realize that it's a problem. You have to say, I know, yes. And then you have to change. These are the steps to repentance. It's not saying, God, I'm sorry. Right? We had things posted to the board. I'll, I'll, I'll repent. What does that mean to you to repent? Because repentance means that you completely change and you never look back. It means that you put to death your earthly nature, and you embrace the Holy Spirit in his guidance, and you follow Jesus Christ from right now forward. Yes.